So why don't we go ahead and get started. This is a session called Making Beautiful Maps. When we first introduced it about four years ago, it was called Make, Making Beautiful Maps dot 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 with GIS. Because we wanted to prove that you can use GIS technology to make beautiful maps. My name's Aileen Buckley. I'm a cartographer at Esri. This is my colleague, Ken Field. He's and a cartographer at Esri as well. Both of us have, uh, can I just say, over 20 years of map making experience each, and leave it at that. <laughs> We've been making maps for a long, long time, and we're really in a very interesting position right now because we have the technology to go to the web with our maps very, very easily. And so we're going to be in this session today showing you some of the maps we've made. And we're going to explain some of the methods that we use to make those maps. And we'll also share some of the resources that we've developed with you. And I'm going to be looking at a bivariate choropleth map. Sorry about the temporal map. Ken's going to be looking at a Menard flow map of Napoleon's March and also a desimetric map. So let's just go ahead and get started. I'm going to jump right in and start with the bivariate choropleth map. What is a bivariate choropleth map? Well, first of all, it's a map that shows two variables at the same time. And it uses a choropleth map method to fill polygons with color. And the polygon fill relates to quantitative value. Now, choropleth comes from the Greek choro and pleth. And you'll often hear it mispronounced chloro. It's not chloro. It's choro, which means area or region, and pleth, which means quantity or increase. So these are quantitative maps for aerial features, and we're using color as the symbol. So when you're using any choropleth map, these maps will give an impression that what's inside the aerial unit is uniform, and that breaks will occur abruptly at those aerial unit, aerial unit boundaries. So what you want to do is use quantitative values that are what's called spatially intensive. That means it doesn't depend on the size of the area. And to learn more about that, there's an ARC user article in the winter issue that really talks about this in detail. But let's just say for now, you can't use choropleth maps with things like counts or raw values, okay? And we're going to extend that to multiple variables. A bivariate or a trivariate choropleth map is one of many methods that you can use to map multiple variables. The purpose of multivariate mapping is to display more than one variable simultaneously. And that allows people to estimate the degree of spatial correlation just visually. Now, of course, we could do spatial analysis as well, but sometimes we just want to see the relationship between those two variables, and we're using the most powerful processing machine we have, which is our human brain visual system. So the effectiveness of the multivariate map method is going to be related to the readability of the map, because you're asking people now to look at a map to understand more than one variable. The map has to be readable. And it also has to have an accurate representation of the data. Multivariate and bi or bivariate and trivariate choropleth maps are in this class of um, multivariate maps that are called cross-variable mapping. And we're just going to simply show these multiple variables within a homogeneous area, area. And that homogeneous area is going to carry information for multiple map themes. So these are some very early um, bivariate choropleth maps. And you can see there are three different distributions that are being overlaid here. And we also have quantitative, qualitative representations. This is a trivariate, set of trivariate choropleth maps. And this is a more recent bivariate choropleth map that was in the um, Mapping Census 2000 book that came out, um, well, 10 years ago. Now, cross-variable mapping, including bivariate, trivariate mapping, has some limitations. And because the number of classes that the human eye can see is limited, 
we really want to restrict the number of variables we're showing on these maps to either two or three variables. The advantages are also, you need to be very careful about using the appropriate symbol choices, in this case color, when you're making these, uh, when you're making these maps. The advantage is that you can very easily visually see the relationship between these two or three variables. But we also recommend that you create separate maps for each of the variables that are being mapped using this method so that people can, instead of trying to tease out what they think they're seeing for each of the two variables, look directly to the maps that carry that information. Okay. So this is a map that you might have seen. It's down at the other end of the convention center, and it's a relationship between diabetes and obesity. And using this map, you can see that there are some very prominent patterns. We don't even have to do a spatial analysis to see that there's something going on in that southeastern part of the United States, and also that um, there seems to be a pattern in the southwestern part of the United States. Okay? So any place that's that darkest sort of gray blue has high diabetes and high obesity. Anything that is that sort of brighter blue is high diabetes, low obesity. Anything that is shown with a brighter yellow is high obesity, low diabetes. Okay? So that's how you read these maps. How many people can see those patterns and understand what they're seeing? Okay, great. Now, we have in work, not released yet, but I'm going to show it to you. It will be released as soon as we can. A new renderer that's just, it's just a sample. But you can't make these bivariate Corpuff maps right now just using what's in the renderings part of ArcMap. So what you would do is you would download this zip file and you would register the DLL and we would give you instructions on how to do that. And then you would begin to use that tool. And I'm going to point out this note that I said earlier, which is that it's important to use the appropriate symbol choices when you're making these maps. So let's see how this renderer creates these symbols. It's really pretty clever. <laughs> okay, so this is our diabetes and obesity map. And this was created using the method that you would use in ArcMap before I had any of these tools constructed. So I don't want to tell you about that. It's tedious. But let's just take a look at the data. If we open the attribute table for this diabetes and obesity feature class, then you can see that we have each county, and we have some value that re represents the percent of people in that county that are obese and the percent that are di diabetic. And then we just have the shape, length, and area. With that renderer installed, let me also turn off the one that's already rendered and show you that this is just using a sing single symbol on the choice of renderers. When it's in that renderer is installed, you'll see down here that you have the option for the bivariate renderer. Now this bivariate renderer will either construct a two by two matrix, a three by three matrix, or a four by four matrix. A four by four matrix of what? Well, let's set this to be three, and let's put on the left side the percent diabetic, and on the bottom the percent obese. And it's calculating on the fly the quantiles. When you're using two different maps and you're trying to show the relationship between those two maps, using the quantile classification method is very appropriate because you're saying, show me the top group in the one and the top group in the other, the bottom group in the one and the bottom group in the other. So it's apples to apples. So it's automatically using a quantile um, classification scheme on both of these 
either with two quantiles, three quantiles, or four quantiles. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and say OK, and let's just take a look at that. I'll turn off state lines so it draws a little bit more quickly, and let's just redraw that map. I... It's not going to be me today. Not a problem. I wish I hadn't said that. <laughs> not a problem. I'm going to go over here to my second demo, and I'm just going to copy this cancer, um, let's see, this data set here. So I'm just going to copy the layer and paste it. Now this data, if I show you these data, um, include what is uh, a cancer mortality rate for females, a cancer mortality rate for males. This one I've constructed a little bit differently. Let me not show you that yet. Let me try this renderer again. I'm so brave. I am so brave. <laughs> Here's the renderer. Let's do a 4 by 4 in this case. And let's again choose our female rate and our male rate. And I'm going to click OK. And there it is. I feel so happy. <laughs> OK. Now, let's just take another look at how this data is being symbolized. What you can do is change this color up in the upper right. So let's make it, I don't know, a little bit more cyan-y. cyan, -y? cyan <laughs> More like cyan. And we'll change this color down here so that it's more of a magenta, like I had on my original map, which I haven't even shown you yet. But let's do that. And then we get this representation of the very, the colors that would be used to symbolize the combinations of those two in some purples where they're combined. OK? So let's go ahead and take a look at that representation. Now, I can't really see this as well as I want, so I'm going to go back to that renderer again and use the symbol template to take off the outline just by setting it to no color. Now I have my representation. Okay? That's how that renderer works. Now, you can see I've constructed a legend here, so let's go ahead and insert the legend. And I don't want any of these other features except for the cancer data that I'm using. So I'll click Next. And I don't really need a legend title because it's going to be obvious that it is the legend. And I'll click Next and Next and Next and Finish. And now I've got an automatically created legend. And I could go into the legend properties and change the fonts and the titles, et cetera, et cetera. But you guys know how to do that, so let's move on. So I'm just going to delete that. Nope, not that. This little guy, because I don't need him. And I'm going to turn this layer off. And I'll show you what I created earlier. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this concept of picking the right choices. And you saw that that bivariate renderer can sometimes come up with the right color choices. I thought the combinations of the blues and the um, pinks, cyan and the pink, were pretty good. I mean, they were close to what I chose for my own map. But sometimes they're not going to come out as well. So let's just take another look at how we might um, how this might look if we were using different colors. So on my diabetes and obesity map, I set this to be a blue, and let me change this first to three. This was a blue that was um, defined by the RGB values of 80, 157, and 194, okay? So it was close, and this was a different color altogether. Of course, that map document is dead now, so I know what those values are. But I wanted to show you 
this little tool here if you haven't seen it before. It's called the eyedropper tool. And if I have a color that I'm trying to replicate in my ArcMap display, I can simply click on that color and get the RGB values. This is added to ArcMap by using the customize, customize mode, and on the commands tab, type in I space dropper, and you'll, it'll appear, and you can just drag it right up. Okay? Kind of a neat little tool, but I already knew what that orange value was, so let's change that one to 243, 179, and 0. Now remember, I had sort of a murky gray in the middle, but I'm not going to get that combination if I use blue and yellow, and it's automatically blending through this renderer. So now when I look at the map, this really isn't working for me. And this is why. Because, let's add the legend. You'll be able to see it better. Because we're really using different hues now. Too many hues. Take that back. Oh. So we've got blue, yellow, and green. And we know from cartographic research that hues are going to be seen as different types of things, not different quantities of things. So this really isn't working for me as well. But that's what the renderer is going to do for you. So instead, let's look at some other resources that I've generated for you folks. I'm going to turn off that layer, and I'm just going to open up the attribute table for the layer that I ultimately symbolized. And you'll see that I've got an attribute for the quartile that's related to the female rate and the quartile that's related to the male rate. And if I just sort ascending on that, I can see that I have four different classes. I'll sort ascending on the male rate. Again, four different classes. And then if I move over, I went too far over, you can see that I have a bivariate class. And this class is simply created, well, it's a field that I created, but it's calculated by simply saying, take class one of the male rate and class one of the female rate and calculate class one of the bivariate whole set of numbers that I need. I'm going to come back to this pop-up thing in a minute. Well, that's, uh, again, extremely tedious. So I created a couple of tools. First thing it does is just add that bivariate class, well, adds the bivariate class field. And then you run this great little tool here that Kevin Butler on the geoprocessing team created to calculate the quantiles for each of the two variables that you're trying to map. So I would input here that I'm using that cancer data and the field name that I'm using is the female rate, and I want, again, two, three, or four subdivisions of that. So in this case, I would say four, and then I would choose an output, I would create a new output field class. Or do I need to choose one in this case? It would be this female rate here. And when I say OK, it's calculating that quantile, set of quantile values for the female rate. I would do the very same thing for the male rate, right? So now I've got the, the, the fields are there, the fields are populated. The only one that's missing is that last one. So see, it's completed. It'll actually look exactly the same, but oh, no, yeah, this one. It'll look exactly the same because it's calculating the very same data. So the last thing I need is this bivariate class. And then I go back to Arc Toolbox, and I say that I'm going to use this Calculate Quantile class tool, and it calculates the last thing I need. Now, that's all I need to create this map, except maybe I need some symbology, right? Because to symbol symbolize these data, all I need to do is go back to the um, category. Yes, categories, and I can use that bivariate class. I'll add all the values, and all I need to do now is change these because they're not, that's not 
That's not great, right? All right, so what I did was I created a bunch of styles for you. And these styles are based on cartographic research, primarily by Cindy Brewer, who we know from her two great books, um, Designing Better Maps and Designed Maps. But she also wrote a number of articles. And this was in a scientific, journal, or scientific book that came out called Visualization in Modern Cartography. And look, this is my example for my bivariate choropleth map of obesity and diabetes. So I used those colors. And here's what I based my cancer rate maps off of. And this also is a map that I could create if I had three variables. The other ones are really for sequential and diverging color schemes, sequential and sequential color schemes, that's what I want, or sequential and categorical color schemes, which I don't want. I'm focusing on that numerical values on one, numerical values on the other. So what I did was I went to Cindy Brewer's um, book, designing better maps, and in the back she has a bunch of color ramps that you can choose from. And I used this five class specification to get my two axes, so that all I would have to do is blend all the rest of the colors. And then there's something called Color Blender, it's just an online tool. You input the RGB value of one color and the RGB value of another color, and it gives you the blending, right? Just basically a color ramp. So there are those RGB values, and I used this to create these. And these are in styles that you can download and use. So for example, here's my blue-orange color scheme, and here is, mm hmm, oh, and here's my blue magenta, or uh, cyan, cyan magenta color scheme, and also created that one trivariate one for you as well. So how do you use these? Well, back here in ArcMap, what we do is customize style manager. And I would probably choose one of those styles that I wanted to use beforehand, but I would just add that style to the list. So let's try the first one, which is brown and blue-green. And we'll say OK and OK. And I just realized something. But I'll demo it anyway. It's because my other one died. This will be a trick. OK, so now I'm going to the properties of this feature class that I'm trying to symbolize. And I'm going to say match to symbols in a style. And I'm going to choose that style that I just loaded through the style manager. And I'm going to match those symbols. Now. Let's see what happens. OK, not too bad. What happens is that, remember, I chose a 9 by 9 style. And this is a, I mean, it's, a, it's got nine patches. So that's a, a 3 by 3 classification. And my data are 4 by 4, which is why all other values is not being populated. But if my other demo hadn't crashed, this would have worked. <laughs> and to, to show you again how simple it is to just change the coloring scheme, let's choose another style. Let's pick um, the blue-orange one and say OK and OK and close the style manager. And again, use the properties and match the symbols in a style. We'll pick that new one, match those symbols, and we'll say OK. And again, I'm getting, aside from all other values, um, the colors that I really want in that, on that map. Now, the other thing is, I'm going to turn that off and turn on my original data. If you remember, I mentioned that it's useful to create separate maps for the variables that are being displayed on the bivariate or trivariate choropleth map, right? So when you have that second method of constructing the bivariate choropleth map, don't forget that you've also got in the data, let's take a look at this one, 
you've got in the data already the, oh, I didn't change the fields on this, the quartiles for each of those distributions. So you can use that as a way to symbolize each of those two individual maps. So there are my individual maps that are going into creating the main bivariate choropleth map. And I find it useful to just sort of give the outside edge of the legend for one and the outside edge of the legend for the other. And I think if you orient them the same way they are in the legend for the bivariate choropleth map, it really helps people know, oh, that's that part of the distribution. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. Now, the last thing I want to show you is a little bit about putting this on the web. The other attribute that I have in my attribute table, and I'm going to use this one because it doesn't have all those other fields in it. Five minutes? No, no, I'm just saying if you need it. Oh. Yeah, okay. So I should be on the internet. Thanks. Is this pop up legend that has um, an HTTP and then it's a JPEG? So this is an image sitting out there somewhere that you can access through a URL, okay? And it's in my attribute table so that anything that's a bivariate chlor choropleth class of seven has this class seven JPEG. Now those little JPEGs were created using this, what I call a style maker, and this happens to be for the... Um, uh, obesity and diabetes one, but it's just a legend that is constructed to show what's in that, um, in that, on that map, in the legend. And what I can do is take one of these and change the properties of that uh, part of the legend so that the outline color is maybe black and maybe it's whiter. Then I can export this from ArcMap as a JPEG. That's all I did, and I created those little JPEGs that you saw referenced through the URL. So when I go online, here's my um, bivariate choropleth map, served as a simple um, map service. And when I look at the legend, I can see that's not really helpful. So let's instead Close that. And uh, I want to configure a pop up. Where is it? There. I'm going to configure a pop up. And I'm going to have the title just be the um, county name, delete, backspace, will just be the county name and the state name. Okay, that'll be the title of our pop-up. And I'm going to have a special little display that is um, not the field attributes, but a custom attribute display. And I'm going to configure that so it is population. And that is going to have the 2010 population. And I'll also show population density, because remember I said you don't want to show totals. So this is just to give people a little bit of additional information about what they're going to see on the map. Okay? Then I'm going to add this media. So I'm going to add an image. I don't need that title. Um, the image URL is that URL that had that legend image in it. And I'm going to create a caption that is the mortality rate for the males. And mortality rate for the females. And I'll say OK. And I'll save that pop up. Now, I'm also going to change my base map because this isn't a great base map to show thematic data on top of. And I'll zoom back over here. 
zoom in a little bit. And where's my map? Oh, turn it on. <laughs> right, sorry. Now, when I click on any one of these layers, or any one of these classes in here, I should be able to get my pop-ups. Let's go back and forth. Hmm? Oh, right. She said enable the pop-up. No, you just have to configure and, and then save them. You don't have to enable them. So I don't know why it's not showing up. But, not to worry. So let's go, to, I mean, it should show up. I'm not quite sure why it's not showing up. But let me go to my content and let me show you what I was able to do with that map. So I have this web map application and what I did was construct from the web map that ha or from the map that had the two variables together and the male mortality rate and the fe female mor mortality rate this um, map compare map configuration. So if I want to look at a particular area, then I can see that on all of these maps. And this is simply using the web map templates that are available on ArcGIS Online. There was, I mean, took me about 10 minutes to make this final web map. So once you have all your maps, getting it onto the web is simple, simple. And I think we're gonna see a little bit more about this kind of thing from Ken. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to him. And he's gonna talk about his maps. Other stuff. Cool. Can you just pick me over? Thanks, Aileen. Everyone hear me okay? That was a yes. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, so I, I, I've got about 30 minutes to show you stuff that's taken me four months to build. <clears throat> and there were, there were a few crashes along the way as well. But, you know, that's just uh, the nature of the job. So last year I, um, I built this little map of, uh, it's actually British coal exports from 1894, um, drawn by a French engineer called uh, Charles Minard. Um, I built it for a couple of reasons. One, because I, I like it. I, I like his maps. I like statistical maps. I like thematic maps. Um, and two, I wanted to prove that you could build something that wasn't Web Mercator inside ArcGIS Online, and that's the Robinson projection. So um, I'm not going to talk about this map today. <laughs> If, if, if I get crashes, I might, I might come back to it. Yeah, and Aileen's actually, do you want me, I've got the mic. So Aileen's actually um, taking this on a stage further. Which session is it you're going to be demoing this in? Uh, mapping flow data. Mapping flow data, if you want to look out for that. Yeah, using a new tool that's, uh, that's been built to, to construct these sort of flow lines automatically. Okay, um, so we're not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to... First of all, look at perhaps uh, Maynard's more famous map, his uh, March on Moscow. Uh, so let, let's do a quick show of hands. How many people are familiar with this map? Good. Okay. Um, so this is a, a really famous map that uh, Maynard drew in uh, 1869. And it's a map depicting the uh, tragic loss of French troops in his... Uh, uh, ill-fated march on Moscow as part of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, now, there's been an awful lot written about this, and, and probably the guy that's most often associated with commentary on this map is uh, Edward Tufty, the uh, um, self-appointed graphics guru, I think that's probably fair to say. And um, I, I, I tend to agree with him in the sense that um, he, he's quoted as saying, this is probably the best statistical graph ever, ever produced. Why? Well, it, it, its beauty is in its simplicity. It's a map, sure. It's a flow map, um, but it actually illustrates six different variables all on the very same simple sheet of paper. Uh, it's got location, X and Y, it's got flow, it's got temperature, it's got quantity, and it's got time series information. And one I've forgotten, movement, uh, direction. So 
there's an awful lot going on on this particular particular map. It's a classic, and I thought, well, what better map to try to reproduce for a session called Beautiful Maps than one of those that I think is probably uh, one of the most beautiful maps there is. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I'm also going to do something pretty brave, and that's try and prove it. <laughs> but we can maybe maybe make a an objective decision on that right right at the end. So, um, where's the data? So this is the data for building that sort of map. It's really simple stuff. There's really not very much going on at all. There's some cities that the march went through with some longitudes and latitudes. There's some information on the troop uh, quantities as they moved from one place to the next. And you can start to begin to see the decimation of the, of the troops. There's a direction. This is advance. This is retreat. And there were actually three separate groups. Well, it was a little more complex than that, but three main groups that uh, took part in this particular march. There's some information on temperatures, on different dates, and that's the data. So that entire map can be constructed out of very simple data. So the first job um, in Excel was to take some of this information and begin the process of constructing the data in a way which is going to support the generation of these flow lines, because at the moment we've just got point-based data. And that was a pretty simple exercise in just taking the information from an origin vertex on a flow line to a destination vertex on a flow line and building up this table so that we've got, we've got an orange, an orange, <sighs> I'm crashing. So we've got an, <laughs> an origin longitude, an origin latitude, destination longitude, destination latitude. Um, and this, this is the data set that we're going to uh, work with uh, inside ArcMap. Okay, so let me get rid of that and go to ArcMap. Page one done. That's one month done. So, so what are we seeing here? Well, here we've got the flow points. These are just the um, origin and destination points um, of each of those separate flow lines. And for the purpose of this map, the flow line is um, uh, demarcated by the number of tr troops that were lost. So when you move to a new um, flow line with a new quantity, um, that, that's wh where we get a new line segment built. So these are the, these are the original um, flow points. Now, what I'm not going to do is be as brave as Alien and do all this live because it actually would take way too long to do it. So I'm going to cycle through what I did and how I do it and, sh and show you the, the results. So from this, this table, uh, in fact, the table is actually sitting down here, this origin destination matrix, the same table that I've just shown you in Excel. It's a very simple process that we've actually demoed at uh, sessions before. But going into data management and features, right at the, oh, look at that, it just, just squeezed on. Uh, right at the very bottom is a really cool tool called XY to line. And if we run this, I'm not going to actually run it live, but I'll, show, I'll talk you through it. If we run this, we literally give it an input table, tell it where we want a feature class to be placed, and we tell it what our origin XY is and our destination XY is, and we, we pick a particular line type in order to be able to calculate um, a linear feature class between different places. Okay, and that gives us the segments. Ooh. Come on, squeeze this on a little bit. It's not going to play, is it? Uh, yeah, let me just go to one to six. No, wrong way. Oh, I told you I was crashing into nine. Let's do it. Let's do it like that. Okay, we can see it all now. So there, there, there are the segments. Damien this morning said small scale instead of large scale. There's something that's... Something, something going around in the water. So here are our segments. Um, and these now, if we have a look at them, have the origin, the destination, and I've also started attaching some of the flow information for the troops. troops. So now we can start to symbolize things. And there we go. That's the proportional symbol renderer to, to, to create a proportional symbol um, map or flow map of this particular set of data. And it looks pretty clunky. And so this first attempt is, is not particularly good. We need something a little bit more striking. 
Now, on this occasion, because I wanted to control in much more detail the, the colors and the line widths, um, I actually went for using the unique values renderer, which doesn't look particularly pretty in the table of contents. But remember, there is no legend for this map. The, the, the map is itself. It's fairly self-explanatory. So I wasn't too bothered about that. Um, and what that allowed me to do was to use, um, to symbolize each of these different values uniquely. And actually, uh, sorry, I'm going to do that a little bit later. Uh, based on the, the value field of size. So we've got all of our different troop values, and I can start to symbolize all those um, separately. Still looks a little odd. Still a problem with the lines. So let me show you what the problem is. If I start an edit session, and um, see, so this is brave, going into an edit session live. What am I doing? Uh, and if I select one of these lines, uh, it's not a good one to select. Let's select that one. And if I look at the number of vertices on that line, there's hundreds of them. So actually what this is doing is, is creating lots of little mini lines all the way throughout my, my data. Um, and that's what's causing some of the problems in um, the rendering of this particular, um, this particular line. So how do we do that? Well, um, you simply go into one of the generalization tools in cartography. And it's great. It's called Simplify Line. So we use Simplify Line Generalization Tool uh, to create a new feature class, which allows us to remove a lot of those vertices. And you end up with something that looks very similar to what we had a moment ago. But if I start another edit session and click that same line, show you the number of vertices, um, I've reduced this dramatically. So I'm now going to get straight lines between each of these uh, features. So that's where we're up to now. We're starting to get something that looks a little bit more like um, the Minard map. Um, we've still got a little bit of a problem with the way in which the lines join. And there isn't an automated way to actually fill in all of these gaps, um, even using some of the Carto Reps tools. Now, I wasn't too bothered about this because it only took 10 minutes to edit this. Um, if, if I was doing road network for an entire state, maybe I'd have been a little more concerned. But with a little bit of editing, just to pull the vertices out a little bit, you end up with um, this particular finished version of the Minard map. OK, a couple of things I did here um, in terms of symbolizing it. Um, I did use the same unique values approach, but I also used symbol levels. And if you notice, all my black lines here are ones, and all my um, beige or tan lines are twos. And that's because I wanted to force all of these black lines underneath the tan lines. If we go back to the previous version, that's how the data was ordered. And I wanted to force this into the background by using symbol level drawing to, to uh, take a different approach. So that's pretty much. Yeah, that's month two. OK, no, this isn't fair. It's the dosimetric map that took ages. Yeah, OK. Um, so then we, we get to the final map. And um, how am I going to put this together? Well, we've got the light gray canvas base map here. But this is a map of uh, a battle that took place in 1812, 1813. So our nice modern map isn't necessarily appropriate. So let's kill that. Um, let's do something else. Um, well. I'm just going to put on a hill shade from the standard topo map for the time being, but I'm going to show you a slightly different approach in a moment. And I'm going to put on the rivers because the rivers are actually very important um, to explain some of the issues for the battle. And I'm going to put on the annotation. And I'm not actually going to put on a little graph of temperatures. Instead, um, and I'm going to go to the web map soon to show this in more detail, but I've actually put on as annotation the temperatures. So there's the... Um, there's the map in, in ArcMap, and I'm just going to close that down because we don't need that anymore. And I'm going to move to online, and here's the web map. And this was literally just shared to ArcGIS Online as a cache tile service. Why not features? Well, the map is the map. And I don't necessarily need any nice clicky things because everything's contained in the image itself. Um, and that's really why I like the map and why a lot of people like the map. 
So this is, this is now built as its own base map. What have I got sitting behind here? Well, if I look at the topographic base map that I think I've got, uh, you'll see that I've got it at 100% transparency. So what's this sitting behind this? Well, this is, a, this is actually a, a really neat new sort of hill shade. It's not brand new, but one of our colleagues, uh, Rajinda Naji, has, uh, has constructed, which builds hill shade, hill shade in a totally different way using light sources from all different angles. And uh, really, I just wanted to, to illustrate that because it is a, a beautiful piece of work. It's probably not coming out too well on the screens. It's a, it's a really beautiful piece of work, and what we're hoping is maybe that'll come through in a future redesign of the, the topo base map. So what do we do? Do we leave the map there, or do we do anything with it? Well, I, I, I consider this part of um, the ArcGIS Online platform as my, my rough working area. This is where I construct a web map and do a lot of dirty work in terms of you know, configuring pop-ups and hiding things and enabling things and doing all sorts of other things. But it doesn't actually give a very good user experience. It's pretty clunky. It's got all the controls that we don't necessarily want. So um, I consider this unfinished. So the way in which we um, go about finishing it is to publish it as part of, part of a, um, a web map app, um, which I'll just refer to as a map from here on in. And um, then you get into the choice of, well, what sort of template do you want? What are you, what are you going to use? And I was thinking a little bit about this map and thought, well, people do expect a bit more in online maps than just having a, you know, a zoom around a map that's been out for you know, quite a considerable time now. Most people are very familiar with it. So I was chatting to the Story Maps guys, and we were talking a lot about the new GeoBlog template that James Fallows used in... The, um, the opening plenary. And so what I did was create a version of the, the Minard map using the same GeoBlog template. So this is, this is another place that you're going to see the, the GeoBlog template in, in this week. Why do I like this? Well, the map tells its own story. The blog I can use to tell an additional story. And working with um, retired Lieutenant Colonel James McGee, who's written a lovely... Um, lovely sort of write-up of, of um, Maynard's battle called Sold Soldiers of Fortitude, um, I was able to tell a richer story. And I'm not going to claim I've, I've made the Maynard map better at all, but what I've been able to do is to augment the map, which is already a classic, with uh, writings that also presents uh, information that, that, that adds to the, to, the, to the map itself. So I use this opening pane here on the left really just to describe a little of the map itself. And I can then go to the second entry in my blog and talk a little bit about the prelude to the march and embed pictures. I don't have any video. There wasn't really any video around at the time. But, um, but this, this new geo blog does actually allow you to um, embed video and audio and other multimedia as well. So in terms of a, a template for, for your web map, it's now starting to bring in new capabilities, which is, which is really good. And then we get going. So the march begins, and our map is now illustrating where the march begins. And as we start to go through the various blog entries, the map will begin to update. And we haven't gone very far yet. There we go. And pan across. So the blog and the map are now interlinked to tell this story. And I'm not going to read this because it's pretty harrowing stuff. But um, what this allows us to do is, is really to, to tell a, a nice story within this whole sort of framework of, this, of telling story maps that, that links together the map, which doesn't have anything fancy attached to it. It's just a map with the main content over on the left, which is the story that accompanies it. Um, I've said it's a blog, so what, I'm, what do I mean by that? Well, I can, this is the brave bit. I can actually enter edit mode here. It should ask me to log in. <clears throat> so I've logged into my organizational account, and I'm now in builder mode, and I'm not going to add anything to this because this is a live map, but down down here is a little add button to add a new post. Um, you can keep blogs in draft. You can show hidden posts. 
So any of you who've used WordPress or Blogger or anything, effectively that whole left-hand side of this story map template is just a blogging environment. So I've used it to tell a story based on material that's already published and historical data. But of course, you know, this, this could be used for live blogging. It could be used for um, updating a, um, a bicycle ride or a walk or whatever else it might, might be. So it's kind of a nice, nice, nice way around it. Okay, um, I thought we could take it a little bit further. So I'm going to go into Arc Scene, and I'm going to flip the map round and start to play with the Minard map in 3D. So let me just change these settings slightly. I've done that. Okay. Now, how did I do that? Well, actually, really simply. In Arc Map, um, there's um, there's a tool in 3D Analyst called the Feature to 3D by Attribute tool. <laughs> You're going to remember that one, aren't you? <laughs> okay, it's Feature to 3D by Attribute tool. And what that does is takes a feature class and it says, okay, so we need some height information. What's going to be your Z value? And what I did was code time as the, the vertical, as the, the Z axis. And there's 175 days in this particular battle, so um, I pretty much worked out what dates the army got to a particular position. And I was able to, in my origin destination matrix, um, place a value, a Z value, for the origin and for the destination of that line. And that then builds a line that not only works in planimetric space through X and Y, but actually tilts to a, a destination point that has a different Z value. I got through all that without saying Z. <laughs> and, um, and that's how it's built. That's how the lines are built. Everything else is really just based around extrusions and changing base heights, if you've been into Arc Scene. So, um, for instance, the extrusion tab here, you can effectively build up 3D walls or 3D polygons by extruding. And base heights, you can actually float your data um, according to an expression that you put in. This particular is time scale plus 50,000, whatever that might be. Um, well, are we finished here? Not really. Um, the cities can go on with the vertical axis to link the um, places to the actual line. Um, time, what about that? Well, let's put, some, let's put some time labels on and let's actually now put some sort of time slices on to create a time space cube. And let's add temperature finally. Oh. <sighs> um, so now we've sort of add, added temperature. And temperature is really only vital in the, the, last, uh, mo the last few months of the battle. Now, why would this be an improvement over the, the Minard map? Well, this actually shows very graphically the periods at which he was stationary, particularly in Moscow. He waited over a month in Moscow before he started this retreat back. He'd already lost a lot of troops, but the majority were lost on this retreat back. Now, if you look at the temperatures, well, I can see them here. It's zero at the point he started the retreat, retreat, and it gets pretty cold. Now, if you imagine that he started the retreat here, he's going to arrive back at around about this point, which is zero. So a lot of the people that died on this particular march died because of environmental conditions. A lot of people drowned at the Berezina River here, and a lot of people died because of the, the temperatures. Right, I'm going to do one further thing. We want this in a web map, don't we? No, you do you? Okay, let's just do that trick. Let's do that trick. Let's save that. And let's go to 3D Analyst, City Engine, Export to 3D Web Scene. And I'm going to go into there. I'm trying to talk, multitask. Minard 3D, my SXD. And I'm going to, where are we going to go? Put it in beautiful maps, put it in Minard. And would you just give me a random word to prove this is live? <laughs> make it clean and make it quick. Purple. I don't know you, do I? <laughs> okay. Purple. 6.3 seconds, come on. 
7.59. It'll do, won't it? Okay. <laughs> so let's go back to uh, ArcGIS Online. Let's go to My Content. Let's add an item. Let's choose a file on my computer. In there, in there, in there, in there, and purple. Open, add a tag, add item. Now, that's going to upload um, pretty quickly, hopefully. Come on. <sighs> that irritates you as well, does it? Okay. <laughs> Purple is now uploaded. Let's open it. There you go. That's now sat in a... a it, it's an applause moment. <laughs> Yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, so what have we got? Well, we've actually got stuff that... Oh, there's a there's Z fight in there. This is all clickable. This, this is still... You can get information back about the number of troops. You can put it into movie mode and start to go around between different bookmarks and do different things. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And then as I was looking at this, a guy walks past my office um, and said, wouldn't it be cool if... If you did it with the landscape in the middle and did, did it inverted, and there's a few slight problems with some of the rendering on this one, which we're looking at fixing. It's, he called it a bug. I'm not sure what that word means. But um, here we've got, we've got a whole series of different ways to view this data now. So we've got an advance and we've got a retreat. The temperature is now underneath the map, so it's hanging from the line and so on and so forth. So how do we do that? We multiplied everything in our arc uh, scene document by minus one. Everything that we wanted below the ground. Pretty simple in the end. Um, but we've got a lot of control over cities and a lot of control over different things. So this is a pretty neat way of, of getting this into um, a web scene. It just needs a WebGL enabled browser, hence, hence no, no internet um, explorer. OK. Wow, two pages. I knew I'd go long on this. Right. That's that map done. Okay. So I'm going to move on to um, look at a completely different map. Um, a map that was going to be on the showcase wall, but for reasons uh, I'll explain in a minute, actually isn't. So actually, I'll, let me show you it first. So it's a daisymetric, multi-scale daisymetric map of the uh, presidential election results. Uh, multi-scale to the extent... That's what? Uh, it looks really cool. <laughs> yeah, no, let's just not worry about it. Can you see little purple patches in there? Yeah, okay, great. Never work with children, animals, and projectors. OK, let me tell you how I built it, uh, at the very least. Let me just change things. Uh, right. Oh. All right, I'm going to have to do this really quickly in white. It's not going to look quite as good. Okay, right. I wanted to make a daisymetric dot density map. Um, why? Because um, pretty much every map that I sort of see of the election results, and being a Brit, it's actually a little bit difficult, looks like that. Um, so that doesn't tell me very much. And uh, even at a county level, that tells me even less. So that's why I wanted to create a completely different type of, of map and do it as a dot density. So I wanted to be able to position um, dots where votes happened, where people live, rather than dots across a load of um, counties where we know that maybe 90% of it is uh, uh, unpopulated, it could be desert, it could be anything. So placing data where people are rather than just within some arbitrary 
um, boundary. So here's the standard look of California. Um, oops. And here's our attribute table with um, our vote information. We've got it in percentage as well, but that's how we can build um, a nice, simple, unique values um, map of that particular data. I want another data set within which to place this map, though. So I use the um, National Land Cover data set. And these might just start drawing a little bit. You'll be able to see as they start appearing. And I use three different um, categories of land. High density, low density populated, and non-urban, but still populated. And you can see as this sort of adds in here um, how little California is populated. But these are where the people live. These are where votes occurred. So it strikes me as being, well, this should be where the map represents where the votes came from, rather than San Bernardino County having this great big splodge of, of blue printed across the top of it. This is where the people live, right down here. So how do I do that? Well, um, another of our colleagues, Linda Bill on the geoprocessing team, built um, some really great tools um, for area weighting. And you can download those from ArcGIS Online. And what these allow you to do is reapportion data from one area into other areas. And there's a whole series of different approaches and different techniques within this set of models that I'm not going to demonstrate. But um, I'm really wanting to take data from a county level and push it into much smaller polygons and reapportion it in a sensible fashion. Okay, uh, let's go to that one again. So I used a few mask areas to mask out airports and other various other land uses and came up with a series of masked polygons. So what did I end up with? Well, let's just put the uh, high density. There's 82,000 polygons in California just for the high density data set alone. But you can see these numbers here have populated those small polygons with a proportion of the total number of votes for Republicans and Democrats um, for that particular county. What are these other two polygon um, attributes? Well, I wanted to put most of my data into the high density areas, and I figured 60% was okay. Um, I then put 30% into my um, low density populated areas, and the final 10% into the, uh, the non-urban populated, just to give it a little bit of a, a gradation. There's absolutely no science behind that whatsoever. That's total, total guesswork. Um, okay, and that gives us this map here, which is a, a dot density map using the dot density renderer within the polygons that represent high density, low density, and non-urban. And it's taking forever to draw. And this is why it took four months to build. And I'm just showing you California. So what do I want to do? I want to publish this as a multi-scale web map from 1 to 18 million down to 1 to 36,000. Pretty ambitious to go across all those scales. I want to have my dots vary in value as we go through the scales to show increasing detail as we get to the larger scales. So at 1 to 18 million, I'm going to show one dot is equivalent to 1,000 votes. At 1 to 36,000, one dot is going to be equal to 10 votes. So with about 135 million voters, that's 13.5 million dots on a map, all drawing at that speed. Can you see where I'm going? So. Um, let's zoom into 1 to 577, have a little bit of a closer look around LA, San Bernardino, and don't slow down now. Okay, and you may just have noticed a slight difference there. We're now working at 1 to 577. Stop not responding, come on. And now one dot is equivalent to 300 um, voters. So there's now double the amount of dots for this particular area than was a second ago. So these are all reclassified. But the more dots you put on the map, um, the more problems you have in uh, trying to get the draw speed. There's also one other problem, which you may have just noticed. The way in which the dot density renderer works is one dot is placed on top of another in terms of the class. So I can either have blue dots on red or red dots on blue, and depending which story I want to tell, I'm going <laughs> to... 
I'm going to create a pretty interesting map. So I have two issues here, this draw speed, and that's a real problem because when I want to publish this map online, uh, my caching tools are going to crash, and I can guarantee you that's exactly what they do. It's, too, it's just too much. The timeout that the draw refresh takes um, doesn't allow you to do that. Plus this problem of um, overlapping colors. So how did I get over this? What I did was um, use the dissolve tool to create um, a set of data sets that I've called high density dissolved here. And I've colored them in yellow because that looked great on the back, black background. <laughs> Let's just change that. Um, and these are now dissolved by county. So I've got single polygon, 58 counties, with the Republican votes, the Democrat votes for each of the, my counties in California. And the way in which I then approached this was to take my classification and build out um, a whole series of columns at 10 scales, two, two extra columns at each of 10 scales, 20 new columns, it's five, 20 new columns of data for each of my, uh, at each of my scales. I've just done the, the 577 here just to demo, but I then literally did a little calculation that said, right, 312,949 divided by what dot value at 577? It's 300. Divided by 300, multiply it by 0.6 to get my 60%. So in this county, I need 626 red dots and I need 1,711 blue dots. Why did I do that? Okay, now I can use that information to build the dots as a feature class. And that's going to get across over the problem of using the dot density renderer, which creates the problem with the draw time. And you do that by going into um, data management and going down to feature class and using the create random points tool. And that will create points within each of those polygons. And that's, again, a pretty nice little tool to turn area data into random points. So what do we get with that? How quickly did that draw? So let me do it again, because it actually works. So we've now really improved the draw speed. So I've got rid of that issue. That's, that's not a problem now. And that's really just a, a bit of a trick to say, well, if something's taking too long, find another way to do it. There's always several different ways to, to approach the same thing. I've still got this problem of blue on red, or red on blue. Okay, and there's another little trick that I'm going to very briefly explain. But effectively, you take one of your attribute tables, and you, not that one though, and you add a column. I'm going to call it filter. So filter for Democrats, number one, and filter for Republicans, number two. I'm going to merge my data set using the merge tool. So all my dots are now in the same feature class, um, all 462,000 of them filtered at two or one. Let's have a little look at those. Still drawing pretty quickly, but in fact, the way it merged the feature classes, I've got blue sitting on top of red. I can't really do a terrific amount about that. If I open my attribute table and add a new field and call it random, and just to demo this, I'm just going to completely break my arc map. If I then in the field calculator use a nice little bit of code to effect effectively populate that attribute or that field with random attributes between one and let's say 50,000 or whatever the maximum number of dots is I've got. What that will actually, and that code literally just goes into there, what that ends up giving us is this. Because I've now got a random set of attributes there. And the way in which this works is you then export your data again using data management and general and sort. And this is a really neat trick. If you don't like your draw order of your features, do something about it and export it using sort on that attribute, and that will change the draw order. 
So what I've effectively done is mix up every single one of my dots so that the blues and the reds are all intermingled. And on average, you'll get a reasonable mix. On the entire finished map, that obviously I can't show you because there's too many lights and projectors aren't good enough, um, it gives this impression of picking out pinpricks of blue where there was high um, Obama support, pinpricks of red when there's high Romney support, and in the middle sort of magentas and merged colors. So, the final MXD, you're probably not going to see. I'll show you anyway. Okay, um, so that's 1 to 18 million. And really, I finished off the map with um, a custom base map. I wanted it in Albers. It's a population density map, effectively. I don't want to use Web Mercator. So, it's an equal area projection. I want Albers. You can put that into ArcGIS Online using your own tiling scheme which we've blogged about on the mapping blog before, and uh, put a nice vignette around the coastline, put some labeling on in a multi-scale level so that as you zoom in, you're getting more and more labels um, appearing um, as you get into larger scales, a little bit of transport network appearing at larger scales. So beginning to think of the map as um, almost a, a, a stack of maps. So at each of these scales, the map gets designed. The dot value has been changed, um, and different amount of topographic detail added at the same time. And I'm really annoyed you can't see that. So if you wouldn't mind, this will get the hits on the website up, won't it? After the session, um, if, you, if, you, um, if you go search for red, blue, and purple or presidential election map or something like that, you'll start to see, see if we can get into New York and see anything oh, it's not yeah okay uh, and that's about the last scale it's, yeah it's not looking, not looking not looking great um but go and have a look on the website have a look at the finished product and um see what you think of it the last thing that i was going to show you was something that you will never see unfortunately at this particular conference um which is this because it's the same problem here. Um, that, that's what the map looked like when it was on the showcase wall yesterday, but they printed it too dark, so it's not there anymore, which is a real shame. But um, the, the multi-scale web map was the principal product that we were going for, and um, it allowed us to play with a few techniques to improve the performance and improve the way in which we um, can get that kind of data into an online environment uh, nice and simply. So I've, I've left precisely 30 seconds for questions, which is, <laughs> which is the way it goes. So. I want to point out that both of the, the methods that we've shown you today is really an attempt to make better sense of complex statistical data through the map itself, instead of having to rely on um, something aside from the human, human visual system. These are very powerful mapping techniques if they're used correctly. So I think they made a nice combination for you folks this year. Um, we do have, let's take a few questions. Um, can I, can I also encourage you please to oh, yes. do this thing, fill out the session evaluations. Um, they'll let us out of our box again next year if you say nice things and if you say nasty things, that's fine. But just <laughs> give, give us some feedback and let us know what you think of the techniques and the session and so on. That'll be very much appreciated. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Got right, gentleman down here. Yeah. <laughs> There's a whole merchandise line coming out. Question. The map's out of copyright. I'm I'm taking it. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, I th we'll be we'll be posting information on our blog, Esri, blogs.esri.com. We generally put our mapping techniques up there, and I'll be posting the resources that you can also download there. Ken, about is that the same with you? Uh, they, yeah, the techniques will appear in some form or another somewhere. Um, quite quite what website? I don't know yet. 
um, some some things you know some things just aren't appropriate for something like art user or um, what have you. But we'll find a way of getting that information out there, even if it's just on the, the daisy metric. I think I've already blogged about. So most of the outline of the daisy metric technique is already out there on the mapping blog. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other questions? Do you mean the renderer, the bivariate renderer? It is a tool that is developed. I used it in 10.1. So it's a tool that's, it, it's actually just a renderer. It's something you install, and then it works on top of what you've already got installed. And we need to clean it up a little bit. And then it will be posted on the blog as well. So just keep your eye on that Esri blog, and we'll, you'll see it there as soon as we can release it. Anything else? That's it? You're letting us off that easy? Is that really? OK, then. Well, enjoy your cool. evening. Thanks so much. Yeah. Is it Thursday, yeah? Yeah. yeah. <laughs>